fingers in the dike. Markets keep fears of a surging virus at bay with hopes of a possible virus and of more government help. This is Bloomberg Wall Street Week. I'm David Weston. This week, Speaker Nancy Pelosi. Open our economy. Do so by testing, testing, testing. Former Treasury Secretary Larry Summers. Catherine Baker of the University of Chicago. Raj Cohen of Sullivan and Cromwell. Banks are uh, the losers in, uh, in a very real sense in view of the Federal Reserve's monetary policy. Syrah Malik of Nuveen. And former Honeywell CEO Dave Cody. What we have learned about supply uh, chains is that they were more fragile than we ever expected. This week, there was every reason for the markets to blink, with coronavirus records being set in Florida and California and Texas, and states starting to close down economies that were opened only days ago. Every county in the state of California impacted uh, by a requirement now to modify indoor operations and to expand opportunities uh, for outdoor operations. But despite all the uncertainty, markets more or less held their gains, maybe not everywhere and all the time, but overall, with the help of a government that continues to give them hope. We have to make sure that, that we have, as we recognize, a consumer economy, the confidence that people have in order to have money, to spend it, to, to inject demand into the economy, create jobs. Now, we all have to figure out whether fiscal and monetary support can continue to fill an economic bucket that is leaking from the damage that the coronavirus continues to do. To give us the market's perspective on that question, welcome back now to Wall Street Week. Sarah Malik, she is head of global equities for Nuveen. Welcome back, Sarah. Great to have you with us. So I guess the basic question is, are the equity markets actually overvalued, given all the uncertainty about the coronavirus, about further government support, and for that matter, even about the election coming up in November? Yeah, you know, we actually are concerned about valuations at this point. We're actually in the lower for longer camp. We think that market returns are going to be lower for here, from here, and it's going to be a longer trajectory until economic recovery comes back. First of all, valuations, as you mentioned. We also have to worry about the upcoming election. We're having a spike in cases, and all of that is leading to lower mobility and a longer economic recovery. And when you look through all of this, what we see is earnings, which should come back to pre-COVID levels in 2022. And given that, we think the market makes new highs in about 2021. So that's about 5% upside from here. So if you're an investor, how do you see through all that fog of uncertainty over the short and medium term to some things that you think are sure bets for down the road? Well, what we're looking at, first of all, is quality investments. So we're looking at some mega trends such as aging, climate, cybersecurity, healthcare. I'm also in technology with digital. You can count on some of these companies that should be growing for a long time. And also, we're looking outside of the U.S. There was a proper V-shaped recovery in China. They've done a great job, actually, with COVID-19. They're in Beijing. They're able actually to test 10 million citizens in two days for COVID. China also has stimulus in place. Their economic growth was positive in the second quarter. So areas like Macau Gaming, they're opening up. Visitors are returning from Guangdong, which is where 50% of Macau Gaming visitors come from. We're looking at areas like that where you can get some beta into your portfolio without worrying about the valuations and the uncertainty in the U.S. But, but you also are interested in Brazil, which surprises me a little bit because, as you say, China appears to be doing a pretty good job with the coronavirus. Right now, I wouldn't say the same necessarily about Brazil. Yeah, this is where we're looking for laggards. So while the U.S. markets have really run up and now we have some uncertainty coming, Brazil really is behind us. You know, they're still dealing with the first wave of the COVID crisis. But when you look at Brazil, they had a nice reform story in place. Um, the market returns have been poor there in the first quarter. They were one of the worst global performing markets that we saw. So still a bit of a laggard trade there, cheaper valuations, um, uncertainty there. We, we definitely agree with that. Sarah, what do you think about Europe these days? We have a European summit that's going on uh, right now at the end of the week to try to get uh, something like 750 billion euros into the economy. Uh, is that a, a better bet for the future? 
You know, Europe for us has been challenging because technology has been such a driver of the prior bull market and even going through the crisis, Europe really is not very levered to technology. So we think Europe is more of a cyclical play. We're not fans of cyclicals for the long term because we don't see strong, strong economic growth. We think it'll be more, more moderate. So Europe for us, maybe you'll see somewhat of a rebound because of cheap valuations, but not an area where it's overweight for the long term. So coming back to the United States for a moment, we are starting to get some earnings out. And one of the things we saw this week actually was some of the mega tech sort of took a bit of a ding. It had been really on a ramp up and now they started to come back toward earth a little bit. What do you make of that? I mean, looking at earnings, first of all, you know, we expect them to be down over 40% this quarter just in general. We're seeing upside surprises because of that dismal in terms of uh, earnings number that we were expecting. You know, technology stocks for us is just an example of expectations going too far, a lot of hype because of the COVID crisis and how well that they did. So this is not for us the beginning of a downturn for technology, just more of a blip as we start to adjust to getting back to normal and maybe people watching a little bit less Netflix, but certainly not the end of the road for Netflix. So you mentioned megatrends, sorry. Give us some examples of sort of the net megatrends that would be investable. So for us, you know, food safety, so um, wellness, so companies that are focused on wellness, um, aging, these are, you know, we can look into um, assisted living facilities. And you know, we mentioned climate change. Look for companies that are highly indexed to ESG, uh, online education, fintech, payments companies. These are all trends that will continue for many years and even decades. What about telemedicine? That seems to be something of a buzzword now, given the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, is, is that an investable proposition? Can you look for telemedicine opportunities? I mean, for us, we think this is a trend that will remain in place. You can look at some of the larger healthcare companies, you know, telemedicine. I think people are just more comfortable using Zoom and not having in-person interactions. And that's a trend that we think will remain in place. Challenging to do it by a pure play on the healthcare area, but you can look into healthcare companies. Uh, you know, for example, we like the managed care space in general. Um, you know, so healthcare across the board, we think, is an attractive sector. Sarah, as you look forward in the equity area, how concerned are you that the companies will have to be dialing back on stock buybacks and dividends, for that matter? Uh, to some extent, the valuations have been supported by that in the past. It's not clear that companies can afford to use their cash that way anymore. Yeah, I mean, it's true. We, you know, earnings, uh, buybacks and dividends usually add one to 2% to earnings throughout um, when companies report. We're not expecting that anymore in our expectations. It's definitely going to be a drag on earnings going forward. So that, that is an issue. And we've kind of taken that out of our expectations going forward. Overall, Sarah, do you think the market is prepared for something that's not a V, not even a U, but basically sort of a flat-ish recovery from here? I mean, there was a bounce back initially. We all have to recognize that. But now it seems to be flattening out. When you look at the jobless claims, you look at so many indications. Yeah, I mean, our view is that what you saw in April and May was a V-shaped recovery, but that we're not seeing that anymore. You are seeing not only mobility data pulling back in the states, which are having a resurgence in cases, but you're seeing nationwide people pulling back as they see the news on cases picking up in other areas. So this is a nationwide pullback in mobility. And I think now that the slope of the recovery will be much slower. And that's our, why our view is more of a longer tailed economic recovery and lower market returns from here. Uh, do the equity markets have their hopes up about a vaccine? You know, I think the equity markets do. And, you know, we do have some promising news on vaccines and, you know, we could get one earlier than expected, but there's a big difference between the vaccine and vaccinations. And I think that path to get people vaccinated is also going to take a long time, even if we do get good news that a vaccine comes out before the end of the year. Fascinating. But do you advise people to remain fully invested right now in equities? You know, we do because for us, market timing is a loser's game. You look at how much money left the markets right. in March, which is a very bad time to pull out of the markets and how much trouble right. that money has had getting back into right. the market. So for us, it's not about market yeah. timing. It's about what do you want to own quality in the U.S. and get your beta outside yeah. of the U.S. and some of these emerging markets. Yeah. Sarah, great to have you with us. Sarah Malik of Nuveen, where she is head of global equities. Coming up, the banks weigh in with earnings in the time of the coronavirus. We talk with the Dean of Banking Regulation, Raj Cohen of Sullivan Cronwell, about what's different this time. They are not a uh, part of the problem in terms of having caused the problem. This is Wall Street Week on Bloomberg.
During times like these, with a slowing economy and some deterioration in credit conditions, even the healthiest banks tend to become more risk averse and restrain lending, and regulators' actions have reinforced this lending restraint in the past. That was then Secretary of the Treasury Hank Paulson back in 2008 during the last economic crisis. Now we're in another one. And this week, we got a glimpse of how the major U.S. banks are handling this one, something that we asked the Dean of U.S. Banking Regulation, Raj Cohen of Sullivan and Cromwell, about. Banks have come into this uh, economic uh, turmoil with far stronger capital ratios, far more liquidity, and they are not a uh, part of the problem in terms of having caused the problem. It's obviously a health crisis which is enveloping the economy and the banks, but uh, this is not a problem that is attributable to the banks. So the banks are in much better shape, it appears, than they were back in 2008, 2009. At the same time, their stock price might not necessarily reflect that. Why isn't the market giving them full credit for the strong shape they're in? You know, that's a fascinating question, David, and one uh, that I think a number of people, and most importantly perhaps of which bank CEOs are struggling. I think it is a combination of uh, three factors. Uh, the first is the um, uh, inevitable that when the economy suffers, banks suffer because they are lending to the economy. So that is a really uh, key factor. A second factor, which may be as important but perhaps has not been as much focused on, is that banks are uh, the losers in, uh, in a very real sense in view of the Federal Reserve's monetary policy. Low interest rates are clearly a major drag on uh, bank earnings and particularly with banks being asked to uh, hold substantial liquidity, uh, treasuries and other very short-term interests, uh, they are affected even more. And I think the third is uncertainty about uh, dividends. So far, uh, banks have maintained their dividends, but the Fed has announced that it's going to do new uh, supervisory uh, stress tests with new scenarios, which will undoubtedly uh, be more severe. Uh, the Fed announced it was going to impose a new rule on maximum dividends that could be paid based on trailing 12-month um, earnings. And I think uh, the market is uncertain. Uh, as to whether the Federal Reserve will continue to, per, to enable banks to pay dividends, even though um, dividends have represented over the last few years a very small proportion of banks' total return of capital. Most has been through repurchases. Raj, we, we are in the middle, obviously, of a true crisis uh, prompted by the coronavirus itself and then the aftermath, the shutting down of the economy. It's not the bank's fault, not the regulator's fault, not, nobody's fault. But the question is, should regulators be taking that into account as they impose regulation right now? Should we be making some adjustments, or are we making adjustments already? I personally think we should. Regulation should never be static and absolute. Uh, some of the adjustments that have been made include either already or under consideration dealing with the supplementary leverage ratio. Uh, leverage has turned out in this environment to be the binding capital restraint for a number of institutions. And the concept is to recognize that, again, monetary policy and the economy have led to major holdings of uh, what are risk-free assets, such as treasuries. So there are uh, actions which the regulators are taking, uh, but it's, it's a, um, a difficult road to hoe because you uh, want to be sure that banks are not dissipating capital, but 
at the same time, you do not want to discourage them from lending and uh, overly aggressive regulatory actions will actually prove to be uh, pro-cyclical in that sense of creating further economic problems. That was Raj Cohen, Senior Chairman of Sullivan and Cromwell. Coming up, can we keep people safe and keep the economy going? We hear from the Speaker of the House, Nancy Pelosi. If you test and you trace and you treat, and you isolate, you can contain the virus, you can open the economy. This is Wall Street Week on Bloomberg. This is Wall Street Week, I'm David Weston. The government has already put more than $2 trillion into shoring up the U.S. economy with quite possibly trillions more on the way. But if we keep having to shut down large parts of the economy because of the coronavirus, can the government ever do enough? That's the question that we asked of Speaker of the House Nancy Pelosi. You have to uh, address the coronavirus issue, as we have been saying all along. Open our economy. Do so by testing, testing, testing. If you test and you trace and you treat and you isolate, you can contain the virus, you can open the economy. The same holds true for our children going to school. They want to go to school, we want them to go to school, their parents do, teachers want to teach, but you can't risk their health in doing so. And in order to open the schools and the economy, there's a simple solution, testing. And it is, it's worked in other countries. Until God willing, we have a, a vaccine or a cure, testing testing. Now, what I'm calling upon the president to do is to use his authority to execute the De Defense Production Act. People are not getting tested enough because there isn't enough equipment. Those tests are not analyzed to find out if you're positive or negative because there isn't enough equipment. The schools are not prepared to open up in hospitals caring for people because they don't have enough personal protective equipment. All of the experts, as you say, Madam Speaker, say we have to have testing and then we have to have the contact tracing that follows on after the testing. At the same time, in some places, like Florida right now, some of the experts are saying it's so far out of control, you've got to shut it down before you can really even test because there's just too much going on. What can the federal government, what can Congress, what can the president do to try to get people to stay home in some of these places where they need to stay home? You and I both know that. Well, it is. it, it has worked in other countries. Uh, the shelter in place, the lockdown makes a big, big difference. Uh, but the president, uh, you know, it's even hard to get him to wear a mask as a good example. But it would make all the difference in the world, and really in not a very long time, if the president would suggest uh, and not stand in the way of sheltering in place. Uh, the lockdown is very important. In California, we uh, locked down, had great improvement, everything good. Our governor just uh, been excellent, Governor Gavin Newsom, and then some of the regions of the state, the big state, were objecting, saying, we don't have so much here, let us open up. And so there was some local discretion, which now has uh, demonstrated that that discretion has led to more cases, unfortunately. It's been two months now since the House passed the HEROES Act mm -hmm. bill, and that is sort of the fourth wave of the stimulus. We haven't had any response out of the Senate really effectively. We hear Mitch McConnell say he's going to come forward with something next week. What is it going to take to get the two sides together to get something done? Because you have the school situation coming up soon. You also have unemployment insurance, which we're really coming up with in another couple of weeks. Another couple of weeks that will expire. I have no doubt that they will come around. At the beginning, he said, no, we spent enough money. Now they're at $1.3 trillion. That's not enough. Uh, we have $3.4 trillion. As you know, the Fed has spent a good deal of money making sure the stock market is OK, one way or another, trillions of dollars, actually. And we think if we can bolster the stock market that way, we can, and, and it's a good thing, it's a good thing uh, that we should be able to bolster uh, the middle class, our working families, uh, and again, especially when it comes to spending money on education. You know, education brings more money to the Treasury than any other dollar that you can spend. And a great deal of what we have in the HEROES Act is absolutely 
essential, like direct payments to people, unemployment insurance and the rest, because if we don't do that, the recession will only get worse. The virus will even spread further, and the, just the unhappiness, the suffering of the American people will intensify. We can get this done. The scientists have shown us the way. We need the equipment to do it. The president can, with the stroke of the pen, uh, call upon the uh, Defense Production Act, call upon businesses to focus on the equipment for testing, the equipment for judging the results of those tests, the equipment for personal protection right. equipment. Madam Speaker, you said they, the Republicans, will come around, Mitch McConnell and the, no. the Republican leadership no. on the Senate side. Will they do it in time to get this done within the next two weeks? Are you, how, what's your level of confidence we will have at legislation out within the next two weeks? Well, I'm, I'm, we're not, let me just say this. We can't go home without it. Uh, and so because of the unemployment insurance expiring and the rest of that, we have to have the legislation. It's been two months. It's been two months. More people have died, more people have gone un, uh, unemployed, and more people have been infected. What, what's the value of the wor waiting? I mean, I know that there's some people who say it's too much money, but it, as I've said to you before, what we're doing for state and local government is one half of the, what the Republicans added to the national debt in order to pass their tax scam, which gave 83 percent of the benefits to the top one percent. We're not a caste system. We have to, we have to make sure that, that we have, as we recognize, a consumer economy. The confidence that people have in order to have money, to spend it, to, to inject demand into the economy, create jobs, uh, that's what, what we have to thrive on and not just depend on some possible trickle down if it happens good. If not, so be it. So anyway, we, we uh, feel Madam pretty Speaker, confident about it. And there's a lot of enthusiasm because much of the un injustice of it all, whether it's economic, health, education, coronavirus specifically, uh, impacts uh, lower income people and people of color in a very uh, disproportionate way. And we know that we must address that. And we must address it especially now uh, when there's just a threat to people's lives, their livelihood, and in fact, the life of our democracy. Uh, just uh, in conclusion here, Madam Speaker, as you point out, some of the least fortunate in the country have been hit the hardest by the pandemic itself, by the disease, and also by the economic aftermath of that. Uh, what can you do to make sure that money gets to those people? Because there are various reports that while some of it has, a lot of it has not. Well, the direct payments get directly to them, and the unemployment insurance does. Uh, uh, we think that the PPP, the, uh, the Paycheck Protection Program uh, with the small, for small businesses, uh, did reach a lot of people, but it, it had collateral benefit to those who should not have benefited from it. So that was unfortunate. So we have to uh, be very specific in how legislation is written and not just assume that people will do the right thing or the fair thing. That was Speaker of the House Nancy Pelosi. Coming up, he set the standard for running a major industrial company through the last economic downturn, and Honeywell came out the other side stronger than it went in. The CEO who got it there, Dave Cody, is here with his leadership playbook through good times and bad. Even in the middle of a recession, be thinking about planning for recovery, including all those long-term projects. This is Wall Street Week on Bloomberg. Work from home technologies have allowed many companies to continue their operations remotely during the COVID-19 pandemic. But industrial manufacturers face unique challenges because of their need to keep workers in factories safely. We have been uh, very, very mindful about our people and we have been rebuilding the flow uh, in the factory from a highly dense uh, environment to a two meter distance environment. 
Nearly 80% of manufacturers expect the pandemic to hit their businesses financially, according to a survey by the National Association of Manufacturers. We're finally getting our plants up to full production. Uh, it's been really challenging. Uh, in the second quarter, we were completely done. I mean, we had no factories open, but we used that time to prepare to bring people back. The S&P 500 industrial sector is up more than 45% from its March 23rd lows as economies begin to reopen. We're seeing a lot of crowding into the value space, which happens to be largely energy, financials, and parts of industrials. Industrial companies are cutting or suspending dividends to preserve liquidity. GE, Siemens, and Honeywell have withdrawn full year 2020 financial guidance. We moved to a just-in-time manufacturing world, which starts as a good idea reducing inventories, but got to a place where you had major manufacturers who had one hour of spare parts and supplies in order to do their manufacturing, which meant they couldn't withstand any sort of shock at all. COVID-19 could also reverse the trend of global diversification because of disruptions to supply chains. Industrial conglomerates could look to shorten supply chains in a process called onshoring. The first would be in the supply chains, the idea of localization of supply chains and the beneficiaries of that, which are advanced manufacturing. Um, so we do think that the law of comparative economics is, is going to hold in, in aggregate, but some companies are going to have to localize the most vulnerable parts of their supply chain and move from just in time to just in case. Major industrial companies face a set of challenges in this COVID-19 world. But Dave Cody had his own set of problems after he took over Honeywell and then faced the great financial crisis of 2008-2009. And he showed how you overcome those problems. And he's written about it in his new book, Winning Now, Winning Later. This recession is a little different than, uh, say, others in the past because of the health issue. So that, of course, has to come first. Uh, that being said, all recessions are the same in that uh, they're all painful and unpleasant. They just are, and that's why I used to say, that's why they call it a recession and they don't call it a party. That being said, there's uh, things that I think are important to think about in any recession if you're a leader. The first one is not to panic. And it's a very easy thing to do when everybody around you, no offense, but the media, uh, the people that you work with, uh, are all panicking over it, uh, talking about it. Don't panic yourself. Try to keep a, a level head. Second one, uh, be able to still think independently. And I'm fond of saying that the ability to think independently is a lot more rare than being smart. And there's a lot of smart people who can tell you why things are the way they are, but focus on looking at it and making an independent decision. The third one, don't forget about your customer because when it comes to both surviving the short term and the long term, customers will remember. So make sure you stay focused on them. The fourth one would be, even in the middle of a recession, be thinking about planning for recovery, including all those long-term projects that you had going that were gonna support, uh, support customers. So D Dave, when you have tough times like this, I understand the idea of not panicking now and keeping an eye off, off over on the horizon. How do you make sure you've got the cash to do that? Because you may really be pushed pretty hard. Uh, how do you manage things like dividends? How do you manage things like stock buybacks? How do you make sure you have money to invest at the same time that your business is in a downturn? Well, uh, the first priority has to be protection of the entity itself, the business. Because if you don't protect that and you get hung up on, well, wait a minute, I can't lay off employees, I can't furlough employees, I can't cut the dividend, you end up in a horrible place where everybody is unhappy. So I always start first with what's the right thing for the company long term? What do you think about the situation with supply lines right now? Are we going to fundamentally change those? Are we going to be much less dependent, for example, on China going forward? Uh, what we have learned about supply uh, chains is that they were more fragile than we ever expected. Totally independent of China, just overall more fragile. If you have a single source of supply, whether it's an internal or external component, there's only one country it comes out of, and that country has an issue, you have a fragile supply line. So there's a revisit that's going to have to go uh, for everybody's supply chain to say, is it, can I make it more robust? So in the event of any kind of disaster, pandemic or otherwise, I have an alternate source of supply and I can recover. The thing that worries me is that that legitimate issue 
can be pushed into everything has to be done domestically. Whatever country you're in, you have to be able to do it there. That would be a mistake because we don't then take advantage of each other's country's strengths and, uh, and weaknesses. And we need to be able to focus on those strengths in order to have a great supply chain that can very well be global. It just needs to be robust. That was Dave Cody, executive chairman of Vertiv Holdings and former CEO of Honeywell. Coming up, our virtual roundtable with special contributor Larry Summers and Catherine Baker of the University of Chicago as we sort out how to manage a public health crisis and an economic crisis at the same time. This is Wall Street Week on Bloomberg. This is Wall Street Week. I'm David Weston. It's time now for our virtual roundtable in this new coronavirus world. And we welcome today both Larry Summers, our very special contributor for Wall Street Week of Harvard, of course, and also Catherine Baker, who is the dean of the Harris School of Public Policy at the University of Chicago. So, Catherine, thank you for joining us here on Wall Street Week. I want to take advantage of your expertise in health care. It's such a big issue right now. As we look at places like southern Florida, as Texas, even California, is this thing out of control? I worry that it is, and the spike that we're seeing in cases really interferes with our ability to resume economic activity as well as posing a potentially tragic health consequence. So, Larry, in fairness to you, you've been warned about this since the very beginning of Wall Street Week, pretty much, saying this is worse than we think and we got to really clamp down on it. Is there anything at this point we can do to get control of it again? Look, uh, David, this was predictable and predicted. We we're running with uh, R0, a contagion factor of two and a half in normal times. When we did lockdown, we brought it down to perhaps 0.8. That meant we could only bring it a very small part of the way back without having the virus explode unless we had a comprehensive testing, contact tracing, and masking regime. We had none of those things because of a generalized abdication of public responsibility. And this is not actually rocket science. If we test enough people, if, enough, if people are careful enough about masking, if we contact trace after we test, after we brought the thing down to a small scale, small scale whack-a-mole works, large scale whack-a-mole doesn't. It's not a question of science. It's a question of political will. But I'd, I'd be interested in getting Catherine's view on something that I haven't quite been able to figure out looking at the press, which is out of control is a kind of general set of words. But if you had to say, Catherine, if a place like Germany, things are under control, call that a one. And New York City in April, um, where the whole thing was completely exploding, call that 100. Where is it you think uh, Texas, Florida, and California are? And where do you think it will peak there? Are we looking at a reprise of New York, or are we looking at something terrible but not that terrible? Well, I certainly hope that it won't be that terrible. And there are a few things that weigh potentially on the side of it being a little less out of control. And that's that we know a bit better about how the disease spreads. We have some treatment options available that have been developed through understanding what's worked in the past and what hasn't. We don't have the magic bullet that we're hoping for yet. We don't have a vaccine, but I think that the physician and healthcare provider workforce knows a bit better how to manage the conditions to keep people out of ICUs. And we know how important it is to be wearing masks, to be keeping physical distance, to be lowering density. So it does not need to be as bad as New York. The question of whether it will be or not depends on the political will that you've identified and that the public's ability to comply with best practices consistently. And you raised a really key point that keeping the levels lower is really important, not just to prevent unnecessary deaths and sickness, but also because it opens up tools we wouldn't otherwise have. You can't do contact tracing 
when disease is spreading like wildfire, but when the numbers are lower, then you can actually do an even better job at isolating cases, tracing contacts, enforcing quarantines and isolation. So there's a, a compounding effect when things start to get out of control that you lose valuable tools. Can I ask you another question, uh, uh, Kathy? Uh, uh, go ahead, Dick. No, please, Larry, go ahead. Catherine, something I've wondered, you and I are both in uh, the university uh, sector. A college dorm or a set of college dorms are a lot like a cruise ship. People are engaged in intense social activity. They're close together. They sometimes end up in places they weren't planning uh, to end up. Everybody's trying to have a very good time. I worry that we are launching yeah. thousands of cruise ships in September. And people on cruise ships probably aren't that great at obeying the rules and doing what they should. And my experience with 19-year-olds suggests they're not so great at it either. Are you comfortable with the consequences of the degree of resumption of college that we're going to have? Certainly, there's a lot of variation school to school. I know both of our universities are taking very seriously the protection of our students, staff, faculty, communities, and that means much less dense population than you would ordinarily have. The real question, I think, is making sure that any outbreaks among the student body don't propagate to the staff, faculty, community, neighborhood, where there are going to be higher vulnerabilities in the population. People in that prime age, college age group are less vulnerable, although not invulnerable, as, though, as many of them may think, but they have much lower mortality and morbidity rates and making sure that any outbreaks there are caught early, traced, contained, will protect the surrounding communities. And that's what I would worry about the most in terms of things like mortality, although, of course, we're very worried about the health of everyone in our community. So I, I think there's good cause to be nervous and to be doing an aggressive job of tracking, tracing, and isolating. My uh, Catherine, if you can. Yeah, go ahead, Laurie. My view, for what it's worth, is that college administrators can de-densify all they want, but 19 and 20-year-olds will be prone to densify themselves, um, whatever the rules, whatever the rules are, and the rules won't be followed. I think the question is but that's why whether you can make everybody test. Sorry, that's why the tracking and tracing is very important. Exactly. I, think, yeah. I, I don't believe they're going to keep things safe by de-densifying. It may be that by testing everybody every three or four days um, and then isolating people who test positive, it may be that that will work to keep things under control. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a, a real possibility. And I think I hope that that's what they're banking on, really, rather than banking on the ability to maintain discipline about people visiting other students, people visiting, students visiting other students in their rooms and students not getting into crowded spaces to have parties yeah. or students reliably wearing masks, because yeah. I don't think any of that is very likely to happen. So, so I'll, I'll just weigh in, in here for a moment as a fact witness, not an expert witness, but I have a son who will be one of those kids going on a cruise ship for his freshman year in about two or three weeks' time. And I'll tell you, they're testing once every week. They're going to test, and they've got an isolation dorm they'll send them to, so they think, and they've got an extensive contact tracing. We'll see if it works. I don't know, but they're, they're making really extraordinary efforts, as Catherine suggested, both Harvard and University of Chicago are. So many thanks now to Catherine Baker. She is the dean of the Harris School of Public Policy at the University of Chicago. And Larry Summers of Harvard, he's going to be staying with us, because when we come back, we're going to talk about the state of the U.S. economy. That's coming up next on Wall Street Week on Bloomberg.
This is Wall Street Week. I'm David Weston. We're back now with our special contributor, Larry Summers. Larry, one of the things that struck me this week is that the HHS, Department of Health and Human Services, ordered the CDC not to be collecting the data from the hospitals anymore. That data has to go directly to HHS. And as a result, at least thus far, some websites have shut down. What does that tell us, even beyond the coronavirus, more generally about the government response to this pandemic? We're seeing the kind of state failure, basic breakdown of public functioning that scholars used to use in analyzing developing countries and explaining why they were poor and why they stayed poor and why they weren't able to push their economies forward and raise the life expectancy of their people. Analyses that people thought of as relevant to understanding failed governance in some of the poorest countries in the world now look relevant uh, in uh, the uh, United States. A government that is legitimate is central to a healthy society. And for a government to be perceived as legitimate, it has to be minimally competent in dealing with threats to its citizenry. And ours of late has not been. And shutting down the flow of information to an institution like the Center for Disease Control is of a piece with withdrawing from the WHO, of a piece with saying that masks are a terrible thing, of a piece with recommending that people inject themselves with uh, disinfectant, uh, it is the stuff that one associates with the poorest and least functional societies in the world, not the world's uh, reigning uh, superpower. And more than any specific tactical uh, decision, this breakdown in the functioning of federal governance um, is, I think, what is most troubling to me as I think about the country's future. The president has been beyond bad, and many of the people he has appointed have been beyond bad. But this has been coming for a long time in the unwillingness of uh, our political leaders to adequately fund uh, basic functions of uh, government. Why should it be that uh, we're only able to audit half as many tax returns of wealthy people as we were um, a decade ago? Why should it be that in the United States there are any bridges that uh, collapse? Why should it be that American children uh, lost IQ because they drank uh, lead water with uh, lead in it because that's what their government uh, told them uh, to do. I think that beyond the ideological debates about policy, central to the American project has to be reviving the basic competence of our government. So, so Larry, you've raised questions before about the competence of the U.S. government. If the U.S. government's not getting it done to your satisfaction, is there strength in numbers? We have the G20 finance ministers going to meet under the auspices of the chairmanship of Saudi Arabia over the weekend. They're going to reportedly try to come up with a way of really shoring up the global economy. Do you have high hopes for that? I'd be tempted to call it a train wreck, but a train wreck is a more significant event than this meeting is going to be. Thanks to America moving from its usual role of an initiator and a leader of uh, policy in the G20 to being a blocker of progress, we're not going to see serious discussion of providing financial assistance to poor countries that are in desperate condition. We're not going to see cooperation and agreement in how we're going to handle the global distribution of a vaccine. We're not going to see cooperation on taxing the world's richest uh, companies that locate their income in cyberspace and don't pay any uh, taxes. We're not going to see progress in, even though it's less in the headlines because of COVID, 
what is an epically important problem, uh, climate uh, change. We're not going to see serious discussion of what the role of the dollar in the international system is going uh, to be at a time when there have been things that some people think of as abuse of the dollar's power and that others resent uh, mm -hmm. very much. None of the important global issues that it's the job of finance ministers to discuss are going to see genuinely serious discussion and uh, any uh, meaningful progress. David, I think when historians go back and write about this moment, one of the themes they are going to pick up is that in the economic area, it was a moment of extraordinary activity, budget deficits, central banks, lending money to everybody in sight, that it was a moment of extraordinary activity in response to COVID. But in the international area, it was a moment of staggering passivity. That's very different than in 2008, when with Gordon Brown's leadership and President Obama's uh, leadership at the London summit, it was international energy matching very strong domestic uh, efforts. And that's the fault of everybody uh, involved, but given its traditional role, I think the United States is uh, going to be blamed. In, in many ways, the United States is acting right. like a declining power right. in the right. same way that Britain right. acted as abdicated responsibility right. during the Depression period. Yeah, it's, it's fascinating. Also, to me, Larry, it's fascinating because if there were ever a time for the world to get together, it would be in a pandemic where it's nobody's fault, it's a virus, and we could all act together and help one another. And yet, despite that, as you suggest, we're less together than we were in other situations where we really had much more divisions among us. So thank you so much to Larry Summers. He is our very special contributor for Wall Street Week. Finally, one more thought. The bigger they are, the harder they may fall. The tech sector had already largely taken over the markets, accounting for nearly 40% of the S&P 500, with the FANG index rising more than 100% since its March lows. And Amazon, well, Amazon stock traded this week for over $3,000 a share. When you look at the market, you consider that there are five stocks that represent almost 30% of the total valuation. But this week saw a cloud or two on the tech horizon as governments focused their antitrust power on how big they've gotten and their taxing power on how rich they've gotten. The fight against aggressive tax planning is a marathon. This is not a sprint. And this marathon, well, it does take place on very hilly grounds. And it certainly didn't help matters when someone got a hold of the Twitter accounts of people like Bill Gates and Warren Buffett and former Vice President Biden this week and tried to run a Bitcoin scam in their name. So it may not come as a big surprise that some megatech stocks started to head back down toward Earth this week. But as corporate leadership heads to Washington for a big antitrust hearing at the end of the month, we have to ask ourselves not whether they're too big to fail, but whether they're too big to rein in. That does it for this edition of Wall Street Week. I'm David Weston. This is Bloomberg. See you next week.